When it comes to the destructive power and nature of the earthquakes, it comes to your mind the loss of life and property that they cause. Historically, earthquakes have been the cause of most deaths uh, on the Earth in terms of natural disasters. And as we talked about in the, when we talked about the magnitude video, earthquakes have more power than anything you can think of on Earth. In fact, I think the only thing that's more powerful than earthquakes would be a meteor strike or a gamma ray burst or something like that. And Earth hasn't really undergone gamma ray burst that we know of. But certainly meteor strikes and comet strikes have happened in the past, but they have slowed down by now. And so the, the thing that has left that has the most power would be probably earthquakes, followed closely by supermassive volcanoes exploding. But the last one that happened was Krakatoa quite a long time ago. And there have, there have been several stronger earthquakes since then. And earthquakes cause a lot of death because the human infrastructure is not always ready to deal with the power that nature has and it is a manifestation of nature's power to change the world uh, and earthquakes is a product of both plate tectonics and deformations of the crust. Now it's interesting that earthquakes themselves change the crust because if you think about it is that there are consequences of geological processes which include plate tectonics and deformations but they cause change themselves because when that shock wave spreads from the um, rock that actually fra fractured or ruptured and slipped and then and when it went the rebound it actually sends a shock wave which can sometimes set off other rocks to crack and rebound as well and sometimes it causes cracks in rocks which were perfectly fine for example you see in the picture loss of property destruction of course but you also see rocks which are now cracked fractured broken in half and soil which is now separated and all kinds of other things that will happen and, and sometimes you usually set off landslides and tsunamis all of which will also cause erosion so earthquakes are also processes that change the features of the surface of the earth because it basically causes uh, weathering and erosion of the surface of the earth the earthquakes themselves and so earthquakes changes the rock itself or the surface of the earth itself but a lot of the damage that caused by earthquakes is actually secondary to the earthquake itself so for example a lot of people die because of earthquakes not because of the actual shaking and collapse of structures which is of course a bad thing but most of the ta massive amounts of deaths that have been recorded in the past are actually from secondary damage such as landslides remember we talked about the past that when fault lines move the soil on top of them doesn't necessarily move the same way the rock does and it actually tends to slip and form these platforms at different levels that we talked about in the previous video and cause these things sometimes that we call slumps remember and you see here that of course they could cause a lot of damage you know you're just recovering from an earthquake and all of a sudden it destabilizes the mountain and it collapses this of course could happen for a lot of other reasons the, the up, remember we talked about the fact that the uplift of the mountain itself makes the mountain too top heavy and it tends to actually kind of fracture and shift sideways especially when it's a sedimentary mountain like you see here that's already been eroded and so it's going to be more likely to actually uh, crack instead of um, becoming a solid if it was a rock but this could happen either way even if it was a rock rock mountain and an avalanche of rock basically rolling down the mountain on a landslide and this will also kill lots of people if it, caught, it happens um, landslides will also be one of the things that kills them it can also have things such as tsunamis now tsunamis are caused because of earthquakes either because the bottom of the ocean moves upwards which uplifts a wave which then goes towards the beach in a massive fast moving wave of water there's a ginormous wave with a ginormous crust a ginormous cusp a ginormous wave period it's not actually a strong wave but it's a very fast moving wave it carries a lot of water and it takes a while to slow down so it kills by flooding not because it has a massive amount of power although it does have a lot of power per pulse but as if you look at it as a wave as a whole it's not that strong of a wave and you can watch that video on the movements of the oceans when I explain about the power of tsunamis and things like that now because uh, sometimes the in uh, boundaries where oceans meet the ocean or when ocean meets the land you're gonna have the the crust shortening and uplifting and folding storing that energy because of a lot fault when that lot releases it actually extends the fault and it sends a shock wave on both directions which will move water if water is around in a shock wave as well so some tsunamis are not caused by uplifted ground in a suddenly but also by actually by the stretching of the continent itself and the plates kind of unbulging from what they were before which is called the elastic rebound so either way these tsunamis are going to be 
spreading towards the beach from the fault that uplifted or from the uh, change in the deformation of the rock back to an elastic rebound and it will go towards the beach and, and especially will increase wave half dry dramatically as it hits the shoreline but quickly collapse and form a wall of water that fastly takes over the land and it takes a while to slow down and at first the disruption is actually very very weak and very very long period and it only shortens and gets taller as it reaches the beach and that's why we call it not such a small wave by the way uh, commonly the waves get 10 times larger than they were in the open ocean so if you're talking about a tsunami that's one meter tall in the open ocean it will be 10 meters high by the time it gets to the beach all right and all of that will come with a lot of speed sometimes they're called tidal waves by mistake because tidal waves are very very massive waves but it, it, and it brings the idea of tides which takes over the land but it's not a tide at all it's caused by seismic activity or a landslide in the bottom of the ocean or things like that other things that destroy during earthquakes are here you see a lot of the destruction that's caused by tsunami is related to the flooding that happens because of it it's not so much the destructive power of the tsunami itself although each post does have a lot of power it's much mostly about the material that it drags and, and the flooding that it does as, as it takes over the land but it doesn't actually take over that much of the land if you think about the size of tsunami it should take even more but it actually only takes a few kilometers of land when the tsunami itself can be hundreds of kilometers across so that's not that strong of a wave but for each pulse it is very strong and it is very fast moving it does get very tall and very short wavelength as it approaches the beach and it does count a lot of flooding destruction another kind of secondary problems that happen during earthquakes is electrical and chemical fires which happen because earthquakes and recently in japan we even have a, a nuclear explosion happen because of earthquakes and that's because structures which were used to carry electricity and chemicals destabilize sometimes and actually catch on fire when, as chemicals leak and sparks flying all over the place. And in the case of the nuclear explosion, the reactor actually destabilizes. So death actually happens subsequently to the earthquake because of things like that, which are secondary kind of damage. But a lot of the destruction the earthquake actually caused is from structural collapse or damage. And this is actually because most of the human infrastructure is not prepared to deal with the power of earthquakes, especially if the local geology is not stable enough to sustain an earthquake of that magnitude. And if it's close to the epicenter, it's a shallow focus and its magnitude is very strong. So when you put all that together, a lot of structural collapse happens during earthquakes normally. So you may have found yourself asking, why is it that some buildings stand by all this collapse? And there is actually no easy answer for that. A lot of the reasons sometimes that one building was hit stronger than the other, remember that the geological um, surveys which we do to find out what the soil is made of, maybe that building was under softer soil and it shook more because of the earthquake. Maybe the earthquake lasted longer for one building than the other. Maybe the building was designed better. Maybe the epicenter was further from one building than another. Maybe the focus of the earthquake was deeper in one than the other. And maybe the earthquake was not as strong for the first time and then the second time. But if two buildings are under the same conditions, you still might have two different buildings collapse because of the infrastructure differences. And also because of the size differences. You see, we're going to show the demonstration of this in class. But there's something called earthquake resonance. And you can look up videos of this online on YouTube and they can explain it to you better than I could. And we will do a demonstration to see what I mean. But basically, different buildings of different heights that respond to wavelengths of earthquakes differently. When you shake an earthquake, the ground shakes really fast. Buildings which are shorter tend to suffer more. But their ground shakes slowly, but with a lot of strength. Buildings which are taller tend to suffer more. And so it actually depends on the oscillation pattern that happens during the earthquake, which buildings will be more successful for damage. Sometimes tall buildings respond better than short buildings and vice versa, depending on the type of earthquake. But you also have the infrastructure of the building itself. One thing that a lot of people t t tend to use is the ideas of shear walls. Shear walls are large walls on the cross sections of the building which used, are used to pretty much support the side of the building. Instead of just having struts in kind of like a box shape, you have a large wall which helps the building stick closer. Also helping is the a column in the bottom of the earthquake. Another thing that's actually good is something called a base isolator. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And also using a moat that separates the uh, building from the ground that's shaking over here. 
Also using cross bracing, which absorbs the lateral shear stress motion, which is the most destructive part of earthquakes. So modern buildings are designed like this to try to avoid earthquakes. And we can do a lab about this in class using Jenga blocks if you want to figure it out what's the best way to use earthquakes. Now, some of the adaptations then that we talked about is there was ideas of shear walls like we talked about, of flexible flooring, of molding and cross beams like you see this building here actually undergoing earthquake shear stress. And it's pretty doing pretty well because it has those those X beams struts. And but greater innovations even are buildings that actually have rubber bearings or support struts or base isolation devices, or basically it's almost like the whole building is sitting on a spring, or even better, on a ball bearing in a in a bowl in a bowl where the building is literally allowed to rotate and swivel back and forth without actually deforming. So you see, while the building in the left here was suffering shear stress, this building here is not even feeling it because what's actually suffering the shear stress is the isolation beams on the bottom. This modern engineering has helped us preserve a lot of the earthquakes from destroying a lot of modern structures that we have. And we slowly started converting uh, buildings to this kind of structure, especially in areas that are in earthquake hazard zones. All right? Now, in order to avoid this kind of damage, we have to use earthquake safety. Now, safety is the following. First, start with preparing for the earthquake, identifying hazards. Don't leave stuff loose in the house. Use doors on your, on your uh, do any shelving. Lock the shelving to the walls. Create a disaster preparedness plan. Have the emergency supplies. Have an evacuation route. You know, uh, also identify potential weaknesses in the building and fix them before your actual building collapses during an earthquake. During the actual earthquake, drop to the ground, keep low on the ground, take cover over something strong in structure and hold on to something. Go to the center, most tough part of the house if you do not have enough time to run outside. After the earthquake, to avoid injuries, check for damages which can usually cause secondary problems. Is there a tsunami coming? Is there a landslide that might happen? Is there a risk for fire or electrical damage? And then continue from that point on to follow the disaster preparedness plan, which includes staying away from structures that underwent damage unless you're absolutely sure they have been cleared for habitation. Following these basic safety rules can help uh, safeguard you from life loss and even property loss during earthquake disaster zones. In the last video, we're going to be talking about how scientists have been taking efforts to predict the occurrence of earthquakes and how successful we've been at that. See you guys then.